everyone, it's Katie again and um, yeah, I haven't been able to talk to you in a little while, um, as you may have noticed, uh, because look, we've just had so many books coming in, it's been a little bit of bedlam trying to sort out, you know, where to put them all. Um, so I thought, well, um, I'll bring them all to you when I'm good and ready, so here I am. Um, I have got a list of a couple of things to say to you, so ground ginger and salted butter I think that's the wrong list there um yeah look we have missed you um we still miss you and um, we can't wait till we're all, you're all able to come in again um whenever that may be and we shall abide by whatever we are told to do um but that's why i'm going to bring quite so many to you this time it's a very big list um we are overwhelmed with books and i think it's a great thing so there's something for everyone in here um, possibly many somethings for, for a lot of you. Um, so we'll go through some of them. I haven't read them all. Hmm. Um, here's wishing, but I'll go through some of the ones that, you know, give you a heads up. These are the ones that, that are in, and you might find something that you like in this lot. So we'll start with Petronella McGovern's, uh, Petronella McGovern's The Good Teacher. So we had six minutes before. Um, that's new in. If you've read the six minutes see you know, that pacey thriller have a look at that one um we have got a new ian rankin for you called um a song for dark times so that's one to keep an eye out for we also have another nick hornby we know what we're getting with nick hornby um another another great one just like you now they're fiction ones just to keep an eye on i'm hoping to get around to them be able to tell you a little bit more about them non-fiction we have the new jimmy barnes now that one is a medley um he's got a couple of um you know storytelling um uh, bits and bobs, memoir, it's a bit of a mix-up. I mean, it is, it is memoir, but as always, the storyteller, that man, absolutely stunning. This one, of course, is our important book, um, another of our important books. They're all important, but this one, uh, Life on Our Planet by David Attenborough, is one we're focusing on. It is our book of the month, so it's 19% off, as you can see, little COVID-related number there. Um, and I do, you know, sort of say, look, keep an eye on that one, because we need to... Um, thinking, I think we are all thinking about ourselves, our planet. Now, first up on, now these aren't ones I've read, these are ones I've been read by uh, somebody else, like David read this one, so it's Ian Maguire's The Abstainer. Now The Abstainer, or Ian Maguire rather, wrote Northwater that you might remember a while back. It comes to us from Simon & Schuster. Northwater was uh, short, long listed for the booker. And um, this one is, um, as David says, look, he, he, it's a cracker, he's true to form. So we are in 19th century England, and to be precise, I think it's 1867 Manchester. Um, Tiffinian story, you've got this uh, American, um, Irish American who comes over and wants to join the Fenians, wants to get in on the action with the getting the British out of Ireland. A book after my own heart in a lot of ways, though I haven't read it. Nah. So David has said, you know, not sure that he was sort of completely enthralled at the beginning by the idea of, you know, was he going to relate to this? He said within page one, you are in historically. It's it's an absolute wonder of a book. Uh, lots of detail, lots of stuff going on, lots of um, clashes of ideologies and getting involved with the people and how that threatens your ideology. It sounds like a stunner. That's very high on my list of two reads, as you all may know. Um, I have a huge list, but there we go. Um, that's not a hardship, that's a joy. The Survivors by Jane Harper, yet another one. This woman really does um, keep us, um, you know, so well entertained. Now this one was read for me, um, this is from Macmillan, so read, to me, read for me by Wendy, one of my customers, and she absolutely thoroughly enjoyed it. She said all the key ingredients are there that make an absolute Jane, every Jane Harper is a bestseller. Um, so it starts with an event that has you engaged from the very first pages. This is what she does. She builds it up and then she gives you a surprise ending. So we're set in Tasmania and we've got Kieran and we've got his partner Mia and we have a young daughter who come back to pack up their mum from the family home and kind of events from 10 years ago which keep researching and then a body turns up two days later. Um, won't tell you any more about that because I don't know. <laughs> so that'll probably be my New Year's Eve read. Um, Great characters, great backstory, Wendy says. You're especially good detective that she'd love to see more of in Erin Falk. So listen up, Jane Harper. You better give us a bit more Erin. Um, another one that we've all been hanging out for, um, and Amy particularly, who those of you who know Amy. Um, Craig Silby, Honeybee. 
Um, and this one, there's a huge amount of hype. We have a lot of expectation riding on this one. And as Amy says, were those expectations met? Absolutely. So um, she says, we hit the ground running. We've got two strangers, a youth transgender called Sam and an elderly widow called Levick. And they're both on the point of jumping from a bridge and they're at opposite ends and they see each other. And instead of taking their own lives, they become friends. Um, as Wendy says, these are deeply com complex characters and relationships. And it's all about the power of opening up of what happens when you open up to somebody else. Um, she mentions how Sylvia is criticizing our society and how it defines or judges people in terms of their age, their culture, their economic status, their religion, sexual identity, all those. And it's, it's a plea in a way to stop doing that, stop boxing uh, people, putting them into these boxes. She says it's absolutely beautifully done that, you know, that it, it is moral. Um, but she says he does it gorgeous with this, gorgeously with this beautifully wholesome uh, relationship between Vic and Sam. And she said it is impossible not to be moved by this book. There you are, high praise indeed. Very much looking forward to that one. Um, now, one I put down the end of last week. Um, it was one of one of. I mean, I I absolutely adore Rose Tremaine in general. Um, and this one I was fascinated to read, um, partly because she does things in this one she doesn't do in all her other ones. Now this one comes in from Penguin Random House, Islands of Mercy. Um, at first I kind of wondered what she was doing with this book. Um, just in the first couple of pages I said, boy, she's having fun. And that mightn't have been the first word I always associated with Rose Tremaine. She uh, creates these larger than life characters. Um, I think it's a little bit like she's letting us look at these people in, in um, oh crikey, and I'm not very good on me dates. We are 1865, we're in Bath, and she lets, sort of puts people under a magnifying glass in a sort of way. She has a lot of fun while she's doing that, but she is pointing to social mores. Again, we have a lot of this coming, this theme, these themes, um, and these socially accepted behaviours can cause distress to some people who don't really see themselves fitting in. Um, so. This is a book about outlandish behaviour in a way, um, which allow our characters to kind of live in harmony with themselves and, and maybe with others. So we have uh, our main character, Jane, is a six foot two, um, strikingly charismatic young woman, uh, the daughter of a doctor, and she's called the Angel of the Baths. Um, she has a passion in this book for another ravishingly beautiful young woman who's married, and there is their relationship going on. Um, she also has a suitor for her hand who's a, a very intense um, Valentine Ross doctor um, and how that works, how, you know, will she or won't she sort of obey convention. Um, this Dr. Ross has a brother who's gone off to Borneo, so part of our narrative is in Borneo. And in Borneo we have, he chases butterflies, I mean, he, yeah. Um, we have an eccentric Raja, who's actually English. Um, we have his lover, Leon. Um, so it's all about how you can renounce convention, but you still have to find our islands of mercy, if you like, in the people who allow us to be, um, who we need to be and who we desire to be. I highly recommend it. It's a fascinating read. Um, and a little bit that, that kind of uh, dramatic, vivid saturation of colour in the novel that makes it makes it very gripping and um, fabulous, fabulous. Um, another book I read, um, I've just put, well, just put down, I can't just put two books down, though mind you, I can, I've got three on the go. But um, this one is Nardi Simpson's Song of the Crocodile. Um, I absolutely, I was astounded by this book, so quite staggered. Um, this is, um, um, a take or a, a an expose, if you like, of of Aboriginal life in a sort of back end of nowhere town, the gateway to we don't know what, Darnmouth, Darnmore, um, in in uh, sort of out back Australia, where um, Simpson describes to us three generations of Aboriginal. Um, families who are living in the campgrounds on the on the edge of, of, of a town um, and she plunges us into um, the first generation of these where it's it just seemed to me to be a book about laughter and love and healing and she has some absolutely gorgeous um, characters that she really brings us on side with getting in and this is what I've loved about this book is that my lived cultural experience obviously has has 
very little intersection with hers. Um, but she, very like the yield, allows you come in and explore a huge sort of way of looking at the world, which I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed. Um, it mixes sort of a little bit of, or a fair amount of ancestral lore um, that was, um, gives you that joy, that idea of being being part of something that's just bigger than you as an individual or your family, but how you're not just country, but that also your cosmos. And I think that was um, a fabulous thing to to be able to weave in to this um, story. We we have characters in here that we go through some because we can't not talk about violence in the colon, story of colonisation. So it, it it has to be dealt with, and she does that beautifully. Um, removes us nicely from hard things, um, but we know they're happening. Um, we get very involved with some of the characters and it is hard to watch their downfall, um, uh, but it's necessary. I think the book is, I suppose, it's like a song in a way, and if you know what song can do, you know, music has powers. So it is, it, it's a song and song can raise ghosts you know, and memories. It can lull us to sleep. Um, it, kind of lulls the crocodile in it, its title. It can seduce us, make us love. And I think this is this is a, a love song to culture, a love song to country. And I highly, again, highly recommend it. A very different read. If you enjoyed The Yield, you'll find this is um, along those lines. But it's, it's just not the same book. Obviously, it's not the same book. Another one to, that you'll all have been waiting for. And if you haven't bought this already, I presume you, you'll, you'll be zooming in or you'll be zooming onto the phone. Trent Dalton's um, all our, all our, I about to say simmering skies, and there's a lot of simmering going on, but this is shimmering, and there's a lot of shimmering going on in this book too. It's absolutely fabulous. Uh, from Harper, I didn't say that was from Hachette, and that's one of their top books this year. How do you follow on from Boy Swallows Universe? Now, if you enjoyed that, I'm just saying, don't, just, just go with that flow. If you, that was your writing, that bit of magic realism, that high pace, that build, that acceleration you're going to love this one as well. It's not the same because there isn't behind it, there isn't the same narrative, but we're never going to write the same story. And all that this sort of convinces me of is that Trent Dalton is a master storyteller and he needs to tell these stories because they're they're just a glory. Um, they're very escapist, but, but at the same time, he's, he's pointing to things that are important. Um, it was a kaleidoscope of image and colour. Um, that gets sort of a book of wonders, um, but tethered to the story of, of young Molly Hook, who's about 12. Now, I love that he used Hook because it made me think Captain Hook and being hooked into a story, and he did all of that because it's all in there. She's a grave digger, um, working for her very, very villainous father and uncle. Um, her mum's already died. Um, she's been um, gifted, if you like, from her mother a um, gold pan for panning, and it has a map associated with it. And she, it's this thing about legend. She has this idea that she, her family's been cursed, and she has to go and remove that curse. So she's got to go and find Long Coat Bob to lift that curse. And on the way, she meets a Japanese pilot who thinks he's going to sort of do a kamikaze. He's going to just crash his plane because he's miserable, um, having lost his love of his life. And then there's an actress who's eternally optimistic and it's just one big heart. So I suppose one of the things, off they go, these these people, it's like a quest. It really is that that quest fantasy in a way, but it's, it's real world. Um, it's a book about heart. Um, your heart will be broken and it'll be mended and it'll be bigger and it'll, I don't know, it's, it's just a glory. Um, there aren't really words for it. I, I just, I was overwhelmed, I think. I, I thought it was a glorious read. Um, and it's, it's, it's wonderful. There are all sorts of, there's love, there's disaster, there's romance, there's um, kind of nastiness. You have to have a bit of, you can't have the light without the dark, but it's beautifully done and it's a great, um, it's like plunging into Alice in Wonderland's world in a way. Now, completely unlike this, I'm in the middle of this, um, but I am thoroughly enjoying it. And I thought maybe this would be something that would, um, it's, it's a different kind of read. It um, comes just from Bloomsbury. So Sue Miller's Monogamy. Sue Miller's American writer written quite a lot. This one is set in Vermont. And we have a, it, it's about a couple who've been married for 30 years. And it's not just about that. Graham is this huge, larger than life, um, 
a bookseller with huge appetite for life and appetite for lots of things, including women. Annie is, um, has been a photographer before and then sort of marriage baby, just one, um, daughter Sarah. Um, and she's the second wife, so she's also friends with Graham's first wife, Frida, who has a son, Lucas. Um, but it's this, a lot of this is, is focalised through her, through Annie, and how she's, you know, kind of done okay with getting back into photography after her, her daughter has grown up quite a bit. But um, she's on the cusp of really getting back in there again. And she's looking back in her life and seeing, you know, has it been worth it? And, well, I don't think she questions that so much. It's just how is she going to get back into, into the thing? into the flow of being her. Um, it's a stunning read. It's quiet in, in that it's not um, it, it's not a roller coaster read that you're going to get with Trent Dalton, for example. I, I was very surprised by, by the book because it's not really about monogamy. It's about who the other person is and do how well do you know them. Um, she has a lot of she uh, could give a masterclass on how we, we look at people, how life is an informal chat how we chat to each other, what we divulge about ourselves, what we want to talk about. It's very sensitive. There are no big fireworks. I mean, there's one event in it, which is like, oh dear. Um, it's a real exploration into how people are, what they're made of, um, and what our story is. I thoroughly recommend it as, as a, a, a gentler read, but absolutely psychological, skillful, depth, depth. It's got depth, that's my Irish accent. It, she's very deft. Um, I love it. Um, just two more heads as heads as ups before I go because I've kept you there for a while and I'm a dreadful. I've got the gift of the gab. I know you've read Marilyn Robinson probably. This is her new one, Jack. It's in the Gilead, set in Gilead again. I haven't read it. It's by my bed with one of those piles. But just so that you know it's there and if you've enjoyed her others before, come in for that one. And of course, the one to finish on this time round, also from Bengal Random House, is the. Um, the new Richard Flanagan. Now this one, The <clears throat> Living Sea of, of, of Waking Dreams, um, I think is another, a bit like the reason why I have Attenborough there. It is one which is going to make us think a little bit about how we live as humans in the Anthropocene. It is fiction, um, but he has a very strong message in this one and I don't want to rush into it because I think it's going to be a very, very important book. Um, and I think I need to take the time and I hope you will find the time for it because um, all my antennas seem to be saying this might be a book that we we just can't ignore and I'm not saying you should read it because that's not my job but you should read it anyway look that's it that's a bit of a thing um, that's a bit of a pile isn't it um, you know have a look um, on on the website see if there's any of those that you'd like to have you can give us a ring um, I'll have more for you, more non-fiction, I'll be doing a middle fiction and I'll be doing, you know, a bit of YA, a bit of junior and then I'll be doing a picture book one, so keep, stay tuned, you'll see me again, um, you poor things. And in the meantime, stay well, stay safe, we do miss you, I can't wait till you can all come in, but in the meantime, get your Christmas shopping started maybe, before it all goes bedlam, and um, I will see you again next time, all our love again, bye bye.